worship really is a kind of a dynamic thing. Worship involves, as I told you before the other day, two aspects. We've got sacramental aspects, and we've got sacrificial aspects. Okay? So we have sacramental parts of worship, and we have sacrificial parts of worship. The sacrificial are when I offer my prayers or when I give my offering. That would be considered a sacrificial. The sacramental, God's serving me. In a very real sense, what we need to realize is that what happens on Sunday morning for 75 minutes to 90 minutes, please don't be limited to an hour. That's another topic for another time. Don't be limited to an hour. Nothing worse than the 60-minute time limit. And so, cut, cut the last two verses, poof, we're done. Or, you know, start whacking stuff out to try to make it squeeze into the 59.5-minute time frame. That's horrendous. Bad worship practice. Anyway. <laughs> so, what happens on a Sunday morning in worship is really just a microcosm of the whole Christian life. God feeds, God delivers, God cares, and we respond. And that's what happens on a Sunday morning in microcosm. And all week long, you are living a life of worship as you do your vocation, as you carry out your task as the priesthood of all believers, and as you're delivering the gospel to people. You're doing what God's called you to do, living a life of sacrifice. And is God feeding you during the week? Sure. You pick up your Bible and you read it. You talk to other Christians. You think about the sermon you heard. You remember that you are baptized each day. You make the sign of the cross, and you remember who you are in Christ. And all those sacramental elements keep feeding you and keep sustaining you. And you keep on offering back to God the sacrifice of your life. That's what worship really is all about. So worship is not limited to, you know, 90 minutes on a Sunday morning. It's so much more than that. It's the whole life of the believer. Everything that's going on. About worship. We're getting close to the soapbox. Worship is always some form of of liturgy. What does liturgy mean anyway? Close. Liturgy comes liturgia, and it literally means the work of the people. So liturgy is the work of the people. In good worship, the people who are in worship are involved. They are participants. They are worshiping. They are working. That's what worship is. Worship is not entertainment. Even though in a lot of churches it's sliding that way more and more and more. And the congregation becomes the audience who appropriately claps when they're supposed to and then files out in good order after paying for the entertainment of the day. Which is Tremendously unfortunate. Church is not entertainment. So, liturgy is the work of the people. And in the liturgy, what you have is this dynamic, wonderful give and take going on where God serves us and we respond and then he gives us his gifts and we respond and he teaches us and we pray to him and make our requests known and he feeds us and we rejoice in his goodness and we celebrate it together. That's what worship is all about. It's a wonderful, powerful, dynamic thing happening. And as Veith points out in his book, it doesn't matter what the emotional level is like. What matters is that God's giving his gifts and that people are receiving them. And sometimes the emotional level is pretty pathetic. That doesn't matter matters is that God is doing his thing. And that's what you need to, you start to learn to recognize, that God does his thing week after week, and we just crank it out. That's what it's all about. So worship is that liturgy, the work of the people. And yeah, as you're probably getting the idea, I'm pretty fond of the traditional worship, the traditional liturgy. But I'm not any kind of a narrow person either. I don't think you need to be. Page 515, that's okay, once in a while. Page 158, fine, that's good too. Page 32, matins, that's fun. How about doing something out of the old worship supplement once in a while? A prayer, a service based on ACTS, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Sanctification. That's kind of fun. How about a Divine Service 3, where we do Luther's Deutsch Mass, and we throw in all these great big Reformation hymns in place of the liturgy? That's fun. 
I like that too. No, I love to sing. We are. Oh, that's great stuff. Love it. I love when October comes around. But is it okay to have a? Let's just sit around with the guitars and we'll sing some kumbaya and we'll sing some cool praise songs and then we'll have communion and we'll pass it around the circle and we'll all commune each other. That's cool too once in a while. That's all right. These things all can have their place. You don't have to just be a high church purist or a low church purist. There's plenty of room for variety in worship. One of the most important things we need to remember though is that what you do in worship shapes your understanding of God and shapes your understanding of the church. And if you worship a certain way all the time, that begins to shape what you think about God and what you think about how God works. And it's going to make a difference. And we also have to remember that when we are the church in action, we are just this particular generation of the church in action. And we have a responsibility to 2,000 plus years of the church that went before us. We need to care about them. See, the church is very much a tradition. It is. And anybody who says that tradition is bad hasn't read their Bible. Because Paul makes it very clear that the tradition that he received, he passed on to those Christians, and they were to hang on to it. We have a responsibility to bear the tradition. Because wrapped up in the tradition is the doctrine and is the practice. And the idea that you can separate these two is insane. And now I will broach my ethics dissertation a little bit. Because doctrine and practice are not separable. This isn't on the test, but I'm going to tirade on it anyway. If you have this idea that I've got my doctrine right and this is an issue of practice, you don't understand doctrine. Because doctrine always informs and leads to practice. Always. And every practice is shaped by and reflective of doctrine. Always. Back to our assemblies of God. Making announcements during communion. Well, what's going on there? Is that reflecting their doctrine? You bet it is. Sure it is. And the congregation that treats communion like it you know, gets in the way, it bogs things down, we've got to hurry it up. Is that reflecting their understanding of communion? Yeah, it is. They're treating it like it's a pain, like it's an, it's an inconvenience. And they're not treating it the way it needs to be treated. They need to change their practice. Because doctrine and practice always go together. You cannot make a decision that is doctrine-free. It's just the way it is. So we have a responsibility to the tradition that has been passed on to us because we're concerned about those who have gone before and about those who come later. G.K. Chesterton has a wonderful quote. He said, a tradition, a tradition is a community in which the dead get to vote. That's very good. The dead get a vote because what Luther said matters. What Augustine said matters. What St. Paul said matters. And what Melanchthon said matters. And what your grandpa said matters. It matters. We care about these things. We pay attention to what's been going on before us. We have a concern for being faithful. And we also recognize we have a responsibility to the generation that comes behind us. Because the choices we make, we are making for our children and for their children and for their children. We're making choices. So we need to be careful and take a little more seriously the things we do and why we do them for the sake of those who come behind us as well. So, liturgy, yeah. But see, all kinds of things become liturgy. And every church does fall into liturgy no matter how hard they try not to. You can't help it. Every church gets their habits and their ways of doing things. It's just the way it is. So the real question is not are you doing liturgy, but is it good liturgy? That's the question to ask. All right, other questions about worship or non-worship or liturgy or non-liturgy? Anything? Yes, Tom. Well, you know, you see in, in churches, and, and ours, is, ours is like this, it's too, the one that I worship at, um, where what, what they've done is they've, you know, tried to as best they could maintain the standard liturgy, but, uh, you know, I, we offer three types. Uh -huh. One that's a, what you would call the more traditional, you know, right out of the blue book, or then a blended one, which, mm -hmm. which kind of jazzes up the original one. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the prayer and praise. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm kind of hearing you say is... That's what they call prayer and praise, because we don't pray or praise in the other ones. 
Yeah, well, that was just what they called it. <laughs> it just cracks me up. But anyway, go ahead. Some people call it the karaoke service, but yeah. that's, a, that's a whole other story. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, but, you know, when you take a look does at the, it. Does the ball bounce along? No, it doesn't. Okay. No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but when you take a look at a, at a service like that, which is really trying to do uh, a lot of the same things, proclaiming the gospel during the course of the service, either, you know, whether... Uh, you see that in, in what's happening in, in the music and, and from the pulpit too and in, mm-hmm. you know, you've got the sacraments and whatnot. Are, are you still, I mean, have you just abandoned really everything? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. And see, this gets back to, again, you kind of have to ask the question, what's going on in the service? What is the, what are we conveying? What are we communicating? Is this all about me and about how good I feel? Or is this about what God is doing? about honoring him. Can I honor God by singing a praise song? Yeah. Can I honor God by singing a mighty fortress? Yeah. Can I honor God by singing a Gregorian chant? Yeah. You can do it lots of ways. So I, I'm, it's not one right or wrong way on the style of music. My bigger concern really comes down to what's the, what's the motivation? Why are we doing this? And what are we trying to accomplish? Are we trying to give people their high for the week and their good feeling fix? I've got a problem with that. I don't think that's our motivation. That shouldn't be why we're there. It's, it's nice to have good music and to have fun and do it well. I'm all for that. But we're not there just to make people feel good. Now, but see, I can even feel good singing in Mighty Fortress. I happen to like that. But that's not the motivation there either. The motivation simply is I'm receiving from God and I'm giving back to God. And let's make sure we don't lose sight of that. My bigger overall concern probably is that we end up cutting ourselves off from our very heritage and we start kind of feeling like we're just the only church that really matters. And we don't have a sense for all that's gone before us and a sense for that history and a sense for that community. See, when you learn that the Kyrie, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, that was sung in the first century. It's in the Didache. Christians were singing that. For 2,000 years, we've been singing that. So when I join in singing the Kyrie, I'm joining my voice with 2,000 years of church's practice. That's kind of cool. It's humbling. It gives me a little more context. That's what I, I like about it. And I get just a little concerned about what's getting lost in our embrace of what gets passed off as contemporary. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. All right. Even looking past tradition, you have the, the danger of people taking the, the emotion that they get and using that as the measure of their faith. Amen. Yeah. Big time. That's, that's, that's the problem, too. Of, if, we're, if we're teaching people to pursue the good feeling, well, then they can start pursuing it somewhere else. And they can also determine the health of their faith by how close God feels. So today he really feels close. Man, it was a great service. I really feel the connection. Got the God feeling going. But when I don't have that God feeling going, I guess something's wrong with me. Then that's not true at all. Todd? When we talk about the word community, um, sometimes I feel that the praise service versus the traditional grace service um, divides the community. I've heard it said, oh, you're an 8 o'clocker. What does that mean? No, I'm a Christian just like you are. It just happens that I go over early, so it's because I like getting up early. Yeah. And you're a 1045 guy. Mm-hmm. Okay, whatever. Yeah. But there's those distinctions that are made. And yeah, I agree. Like, well, that happens even if you have regular worship at both services. You end up having two congregations over your, two, over your different worship times. But that's another problem. But you're right. That's, that's true, too. That causes, can cause divisions. Okay? Jeremy, did you have your hand up a minute ago? Kind of. Um, yeah, kind of a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always been a problem with me, for me. Uh, I grew up in a traditional worship mm-hmm. setting. And everything that, all the responsive stuff, everybody just responded so flat. No, and yeah. without any emotion. Yeah. I know it's not supposed to be about emotion, right. but the fact of what's happening here in right. the service should uh, something. No, I, agree. I had the same experience. I grew up at page 515. Nobody opened a hymnal. It was all memorized, and you would just rattle it off, and woe to the visitor who happened to wander into that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so, yeah, you're right. And that, that's not a good thing. What you do is when you are leading worship, you lead it like you mean it, whatever you're doing. And to breathe life and excitement into the liturgy, that is an obligation of the pastor as far as I'm concerned. So when you do worship, you do it well. And you do it with an understanding of what's going on. And when the worship is done well, it's all good. I like really good high church. I like praise music in, you know, in the right context. But like I said, I don't like 
uh, you know, a band standing up in front of the altar and telling me how I should be clapping my hands or telling me what I should be feeling as we get ready to sing this song. You know, just shut up and sing the song. <laughs> you know? I, that's, I don't have a lot of patience for that. You know, oh, God, we're just so happy to be here. Fine. Pray to yourself. Just get on with it. You know, I, the, what's with this? It, it all becomes rather egocentric, I think. And it starts to become a lot about how I feel and about how you feel and about how we all just love Jesus. And there's not a lot of substance there. That, that's interesting that you say that because thinking about it and listening to Jeremy's question is the congregation does reflect the pastor of sorts. Mm -hmm. I had pastors mm -hmm. when I was growing up, monotone. They didn't change the response. Yeah. They didn't change the sermon the whole way through. Yeah. Well, the whole church was like that. Yeah. Yeah. So your response is the same. And no, the I agree. Same thing. Yeah, the congregation will pick you up on what you do. And when you read the when you read liturgy in an animated way, and you pay attention to what you're doing, and you read the scripture readings like it matters, and you preach like it matters, the congregation starts to respond that way too. They do, and it it it, it, it rubs off. So it has a lot to do with how you do it, how you lead it. Because I remember the first new pastor I had as a kid, and I only remember him because every Sunday was the same. We got a new pastor. Everybody sat in the back. So what did our new pastor do? He said. I'm not standing up here by myself. He got out of the pulpit, walked down the middle of the aisle, about 10 rows deep to where the first group of people were sitting. Uh -huh. And he preached from there. Yeah. And walked to, and talked to the people. And I'm, I'm going. Yeah, that's a cool thing. You see, and so I'm not, I am not, advocating just blind traditionalism or just the way it's always been done. I'm not saying that. I'm sympathetic to what you guys are saying. I'm saying let's dig in to what it means to really have this heritage of the church. It's a rich heritage. My goodness, there's so much there. And we should be just loving it and using it. Okay? But be careful what you let go of. When you make a choice to say, we're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to do this anymore. What are you letting go of? What are you losing? You see, I can stand up here and I can say, like, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, you just bang, you have, you're right there. You know what I'm talking about. You're right there into the communion liturgy. You're at the sanctus, and you're thinking about angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. It's there. Why is it there? Because week after week, you just cranked right through it, and it became part of how you operate and how you think. That's a good thing. And Kolb says it well. Variety is the spice of life, but routine is the sustenance of life. And you have to have a routine that has substance and value, or you're not going to be fed by anything. So, all right. Enough on the worship thing. For now, you'll come back to it again. I guarantee that. <clears throat> so the priesthood of all believers is, in its way, exercising the office of the keys and is doing the work of the people, the liturgy. That's what we do. We carry out these tasks and do them as God calls us to do them. All right, also within the church, we need to talk about how the church organizes itself. And we have a word for that. We call that the church's polity. Church's polity. Back when I was an MDEV student, we had a one-hour or two-hour course called church polity when we had to learn about how our church functions and the rules and all this kind of stuff. And we always kind of derisively called it polity training. And um, so we have, we have to have your, get your polity training before you can be a pastor. So the polity is how the church is organized or how it's structured. And there are different ways of doing it. There are a few big categories to kind of lump these things together. One of the ways the church can be organized is in an Episcopal polity. An Episcopal polity. An Episcopal comes straight from the Greek because Episcopus is Greek for bishop. Bishop, Episcopus. And so the, an Episcopal polity just means that you've got bishops and priests, and you probably have archbishops. In other words, this is a rather structured, hierarchical system. An uh, Episcopal kind of polity. The Episcopal Church has an Episcopal polity, obviously enough. That's why it's called that. Roman Catholics are an Episcopal polity. And very clearly, Pope, Cardinals, Archbishops, Bishops, Priests, 
deacons, and then you finally get down to parishioners. And it's whew, top down. So you have this kind of an Episcopal structure. The ELCA functions more with an Episcopal structure, where you've got bishops and then you know, presiding bishops, and you've got the, the pastors who are underneath those bishops. That's how they kind of, that's how they operate it. So you have different ways. Of, that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is the Presbyterian. And Presbyterian comes from the Greek word presbyteros, which means elders. So the Presbyterian is the idea of you have a group of elders who make decisions, and this group of elders are the ones who are running the show. You have this group of elders on top. And it might even work that way from the, in the national structure of the Presbyterian, where you've got this kind of group on top who makes decisions, and they decide for everybody else, and they are the ones who are respected, the elders who are making the decisions. That's a Presbyterian way. A congregation could function that way, where you have a group of 15 elders who just make decisions and do things. You have another kind of polity, the way you would organize a church, is congregational. Oops. Congregational polity. And in a congregational polity, it is very democratic. And so every member of the congregation gets one vote, and you vote on things, and you decide things, and that's how you go forward as a one-man, one one-vote kind of democracy, a congregational sort of polity. Or you might have just a bureaucracy, a bureaucratic polity. And so you have paid professionals who do all of your work for you and who make the decisions and are kind of running the show. And that's probably actually a little closer to what you really have in the ELCA. But you have all these. Which one's right? Really, it doesn't make any difference at all. This is pure adiaphora. There is no one right church polity. In Luther's day, what was the polity of the church? Very much Episcopal. And you also had the state heavily involved because the state was the one who were, was paying for the pastors. And so the state would often decide what churches would close or what would open, who would get a new pastor, who wouldn't. The church, the state was deciding based on monetary kinds of reasons or on moral reasons. So there is no one right or wrong. We have this tendency to think congregational is pretty good. But congregational has got its problems. What if you have a doctrinal dispute? Do you vote? Majority rules? 51% say women's ordination is good? Well, I guess it is. Is that how it works? If you have congregational polity, that's what you do. That's got its problems. And Episcopal has its problems because you have the problem of what if you have a corrupt bishop and the, the, you know, the leadership, all the powers you know, concentrated in a small place with a few people. That's a problem. Presbyterian, you also have that problem of a few people deciding for everybody. So none of these is neat and clean. In the LCMS, we function with kind of a hybrid sort of a thing. We have a pretty heavily congregational polity when it comes to the congregation making choices and deciding things, and the congregation gets to, you know, make decisions about things. But we also recognize that there's the authority of the pastoral office, which is also needs to be taken into account. So we're not just pure congregationalists. We have also kind of a strong, maybe a Presbyterian sense, if you want to call it that. So none of these is particularly sacred. There's, there's room for variety within all of these. No, no one right polity at all. But any, you might run across any one of these. It's OK. So we don't get hung up on the Catholics because they have an Episcopal polity or a hierarchy. That's fine. It's just one way of organizing the church. Some people want to try to say that the democracy is the only Christian way to do it. That's baloney. Their democracy is never held up as sacred or as somehow being godly. Nothing godly about it. In fact, if you guys have studied political science, and maybe some of you have done that, you know that democracy is inherently a lousy way of running a show because it tends to breed mediocrity, it breeds laziness, and it breeds um, just this kind of general lackadaisical, who cares? Eh, we're good at that. And we look around our country, yeah, I think it succeeded pretty well. 
have plenty of mediocrity, and you tend to get leaders who are beholden to the people and they don't really lead very well. We see that too. Yeah. I was just, as you were going through this, I was thinking about why churches name themselves the way they do, like, or Lutheran, well, that's because, you know, we mm -hmm. follow Luther, you know, mm -hmm. but, you know, Congregationalists, that's, it's because of their, the they're way they set up their policy. That's right. They show their, to them, the quality is really important. We're not going to let any hierarchy do it. Every congregation stands on its own, so they, that became really critical to them, and that's why they chose their name. And the Presbyterians were named that because they had these presbyteries, these groups of elders who would be making decisions for the people and basically leading the church. That's where they got their name. Mm -hmm. True enough. Jeremy. So are non-denominational churches really non-denominational? They might be non-denominational in that they don't have official ties to the denomination, but they always have leanings one way or the other with their doctrine. Most of them are just pseudo-Baptist or pseudo-Reformed you know, or quasi-assemblies. That's what you usually get. You know. Non-denominational churches are scary mostly because they don't have any anchor. And they're, they're um, subject to any old whim that comes along. And pretty much what leads the non-denominational church is the pastor. And the pastor lays it down and he sets the, he sets the agenda. The next pastor comes along, they all shift and everything moves because they don't really don't have a foundation. So that's why non-denominational churches are a bad place to be. Another polity with a, a pastoral polity. In a sense, I suppose. But see, even that non-denominational church will have some kind of a polity. Likely, it's going to be a rather top-down sort of a thing. The pastor sets the agenda, and it's kind of almost like a, I suppose, a dictatorship polity. And those happen too. Yeah, John. Polity can also change over the history of oh, the sure. church. Our church changed from a more Presbyterian system to kind of a more congregational system. We adopted mm -hmm. a new constitution, mm -hmm. but we got rid of the Board of Elders. We went with an elected church council. Mm -hmm. The new constitution called for that, and the, mm -hmm. the congregation voted on it. Yeah. yeah. See, even the congregation voting is reflective of this kind of a congregational polity. You know, that's, that's true. That's how this works. Um, but it didn't change doctrine in any way. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That's why the polity doesn't matter that much. See, in Europe... Lutheran churches or even state churches. Was that wrong? No. Nothing wrong with the state church per se. I mean, that's just how things operate. That's okay. As long as the church is doing its job, the gospel's there, the sacraments are proclaimed, we're doing what we're supposed to do. It's fine. And so, see, even, this, even how we function, we function with um, a call process. So you want a, a pastor, you want to get a pastor, congregation calls. Why? Because the congregation has that authority, that right to call. And the pastor can take it or not, and he can leave. Other churches function, like in a Methodist church, where the cons cons consistory, the ruling body, tells the pastor, you go here. The pastor goes. Three years later, the pastor said, the, that group says, okay, now you're going to go over here. He goes. Doesn't care if the congregation wants it or if that new congregation wants it. Who cares? They don't have the decision. Somebody else does. See, and also, another example, who owns the churches in the LCMS? The individual congregations do. In the ELCA, who owns the congregations? The whole church body does, and you see, it's it's a it's a it's a different polity. So we are we in the LCMS are much more congregational in our overall historical polity than we are Episcopal, and some of that was a reaction against the state church when our forefathers came over here, and you'll learn about that too when the. Um, Saxon immigrants came over, arrest, you know, fleeing from Germany and the Prussian Union, came up to Missouri and settled them down in Perry County. The last thing they wanted was another state church. And so they made really sure that the, the authority was in the congregation. So they're no one's going to be telling them what to do or taking their churches from them. And so that's how we still function. That's the way it is. To the point that our districts, even though they seem like they're powerful, I have no authority over a congregation. A district president cannot tell a congregation what to do because our polity doesn't allow it. We don't have that kind of structure top down. We're not Episcopalian. We're much more congregational that way. All right. We also recognize that we have these things now called denominations. <coughs> and a denomination, of course, is nothing more than denom means name, the name given to a particular set of uh, churches or beliefs. And denominations are funny because they divide down so many different ways. As Lutherans, we tend to look at denominations, and we always make 
doctrinal divisions. You know, what's their doctrine all about? But some denominations don't function that way. Episcopalians, for example, or um, better, Anglicans. Anglicans don't really care about that doctrine that much. Their big thing is how you worship, the liturgy. And so for them, the mark is, what kind of worship do you have? Are you high church or low church? And your doctrine, that's not that big of a deal to them. So churches are going to have different uh, things that, are, that matter to them. So denominations are all over the place out there. Denominations a good thing? No, not really. God's desire is one church, no doubt about that. That's true. His ideal would be for there to be unity. One baptism, one Lord, one church. That's the good thing. The fact that we have all these different scattered denominations is a sad thing. It's a reflective of our human sinfulness and our desire to want our own way and not yield ourselves to God's way. And it's kind of a sad thing. So what should our attitude be toward the divisions? Not embracing them, not being excited about it, wanting to overcome them and working for that. And believe it or not, in the LCMS, we do that. We send people to have dialogues with other denominational leaders, and we talk, and we have conversations. We have guys who go and are involved in Roman Catholic dialogues and talking to them and working, trying to work for unity on things. We want that. But see, we want unity that's real and legitimate, that's based on genuine agreement and our understanding of God and his activity among us, not just unity that is by fiat or by lowest common denominator. So, denominations are around. Denominations are also interesting because they kind of sp split in funny ways. We have a situation now in America where we've got plenty of denominations around where you have kind of two ways of dividing people. You have a, the denominational labels. Maybe the guy's Lutheran or maybe he's Roman Catholic. Or are they, are they Roman Catholic? Or are they... Um, Presbyterian, or are they Baptists, or are they Methodists, whatever. And so you make dis distinctions that way. But increasingly in our culture, people don't care that much about denominational labels. There's also the other way of kind of doing it. Are they liberal and far left, or are they conservative and far right on things? And what you find increasingly in our culture, at least, is that Within any one denomination, you've got the spectrum represented. So you've got really liberal Lutherans, and you've got really conservative Lutherans, and you can plot yourself anywhere along there. And you've got the same with Catholics and Presbyterians and Baptists and Methodists. So what you get is this kind of a funny thing, where I might be a very conservative Lutheran on moral issues or on you know, things like that, and I'll find myself in really close agreement with a really conservative Roman Catholic, and in great disagreement with a liberal Lutheran. So, he's a Lutheran, why should we agree with him? Well, I don't. I agree with my Roman Catholic friend on most everything more than with my Lutheran guy. Because this other Lutheran guy supports gay rights and supports abortion, and we write down the list. Whereas this Roman Catholic, yeah, he's right with me on abortion and you know, euthanasia and all these kinds of things. We're in agreement. And so you find this, and so it's, it's complicated because the political leanings or the social ideas vary across here. And so you find yourself in agreement. Now, some denominations tilt one way more than the other, obviously, and are going to plot out here kind of in different ways. But it's worth remembering that just because somebody has a label doesn't mean you always know exactly where they're going to fit or where they stand in relation to everybody else. So I'm a Christian, and I believe in Jesus and all that stuff. Do I have to be a member of a congregation? <clears throat> you don't have to, but you want to. Okay. I don't have to, but I want to. What if I really don't want to? What if I'm involved in Campus Crusade, and I think that's doing a pretty good job, but I really don't want to be part of a local congregation? And I go, to, I go to Bible Study Fellowship, and I have great fellowship there with that group, and I, I'm part of that fellowship all on a regular basis, and I pray a lot, but I don't go to any congregation. I... I was in a congregation once, man, they just burned me bad, and they treated me bad. My, my husband left me, and they just didn't take care of me the way they should have. So I, I don't have any use for the church, but I really like my Bible study fellowship friends. Okay? No problem? Say, okay, that's cool. 
Come whenever you feel like it. What do you tell her? If you're not part of a congregation, how do you receive the sacraments on a regular basis? No, that's a problem. I guess I can just go down to the church when I really feel the need, and maybe I know this one church will give me the sacrament. But why would you not be if you agree with the doctrines of that church? Uh, churches just burn me. I don't, I don't trust them. So I'm, is that okay? Is it okay not to be part of a church, not part of a congregation? Why not? The Bible tells us to stay in communion with other believers. All right. So, so there are actually a couple of reasons we can make. One reason is because the Bible says straight up in, the, in Hebrews, don't neglect the gathering together of the, of the fellowship. You cannot blow off other Christians. Well, they say, well, okay, I'm part of BSF. That's where my fellowship is. So oh, you've got to give a better reason. So what else? What other reasons are there for why you need to be a member of a local <laughs> congregation? You mentioned already, this is where the sacraments are. This is where the word of the sacraments are. And if you want to be receiving God's grace, you've got to be where the God's grace is. Where's God's grace? It's in the church. That's where it's happening. And if you cut yourself off from that, you're cutting yourself off from the very thing that's going to sustain you and keep you growing strong in the faith. You can't do that. And finally, you can even look at the person who says, I don't need to be part of a local congregation and say, then you're sinning. Because you have an obligation to be part of a local congregation because those Christians in that congregation need you. And if you are not there and are not participating, then you are cheating them and you are disobeying God. Because your attendance in church is an encouragement to everyone else who is in church. Whether you feel a need or not, they need you to be there. That's a big part of worship. That's a big part of why we need to be part of a congregation. So we cannot simply say, well, I just believe in Jesus and I get plenty of fellowship from all the activities I'm involved in. I don't need to go to a congregation. That's not true. The last part of why you need to be part of a congregation, point four, would be the accountability. Who's going to hold you accountable to make sure you're believing correctly and participating and receiving the sacrament? And if you're not part of a congregation, you're setting yourself up real nicely to don't have to worry about being accountable to anyone. And that's not safe. That's not wise. So you need the accountability of being part of this gathering, this fellowship, that's going to call you to task and make sure that you are doing what you need to do. So, yeah, every Christian needs to seek out membership in a congregation. That's expected, needed. Chris? Um, uh, my family had an example of this. One of my mom's best friends um, was a real devout, devoted Christian, and she started uh, doing her own Bible studies, her own thing, and kind of stopped doing the church thing. And the more she did this, you know, she loved it. She loved getting into it, but she was straying just so far away. And my, mm -hmm. and my parents uh, both were like, whoa, do you know where you're going? Do you know what you're doing? And she'd say stuff that would be ridiculous. I don't remember them because I didn't, really didn't yeah. deal with them. Yeah. But the, some of the stuff was just off the wall. My parents said, do you, do you hear yourself? Do you know how stupid you sound? The lady <laughs> said, no, but this is right. I, and she was saying we need to go do things like go back to Old Testament law and live exactly like that mm -hmm. with the gospel at the same time. Mm -hmm. and then then at some point in time she got a call from God to go live in Nebraska and we've never heard from her since. Uh -huh. yeah, she was the just, black hole in Nebraska swallowed her up. <laughs> <laughs> there is one out there. More than one. <laughs> hey, I grew up there. Oh, Be careful. <laughs> My four years I put in was enough. <laughs> I'm a civilian now. <laughs> yeah, but you're exactly right. You cut yourself off from that kind of accountability, and you, you get pulled off into all kinds of la-la land. It's real easy. And, and she just couldn't, there was no way of pulling her back, but she got so far. It was, mm -hmm. just, it was sad yeah. to watch. Yeah, exactly. It is very sad to watch. All right. Another thing, along with while we're talking about the church, uh, and Congress. What? Before you go on, I've heard yeah. people tell me that uh, wherever one or two are gathered in my name, there I am, so I don't need to be at church. Yeah, me and my wife too. both believe in God. There's two of us there. Yeah. Well, then you say, yeah, but you also have another thousand down the street who are waiting for you to be there, and you're avoiding them because that's where the gospel is being proclaimed and the sacraments are, and this is a promise to us when we have no other options. You have plenty of other options. You've been blessed with them, and you're turning your back on what God is offering you. 
but they, they, even if they don't notice you, you are hurting them and you're hurting yourself. Everybody is being affected by your absence. And you're right. It doesn't seem like one person's absence is going to affect. And they'll get along, but in, would your presence there be an encouragement? Yes. Say they don't notice or whatever. I can't help but think about the parable of the ten talents. Mm -hmm. They're burying their talents. That's right. They're not using what God has given to them. And then so. there's all that weeping and gnashing of teeth yeah. thing, which is yeah. not very pleasant. Yeah. I know this. I just have a problem portraying that and getting that across to <laughs> my stubborn brother and other people. Yeah, they're not being faithful. <laughs> Author and pulpit fellowship. You hear this?